one Sunday we might take the time and talk to him. Uh, that just means um, um, figuring it out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But shoot it up here and we can talk to him. But his prayer letter is pretty interesting because he, he's actually being connected with ABWE, even though he's not going to be with ABWE, and filling in for the Smiths who were there at home on furlough. So the Smiths will be gone, and he just kind of gives you an idea of what he had to go through to get to the point where he can be useful again, car, phone, that kind of stuff. And there is kind of a picture of his fiance right there. Um, but I haven't heard whether he's, I told him just get hitched when he's over there. You know, why try to finagle in the United States if you want to get married and get going? Uh, so I don't know, maybe it wasn't my place. But it makes sense to me, you know, why put your father through that whole spiel. But, so now I'll put that on the board and uh, you can have a look at it. Let's take our hymn books and uh, we'll sing the first hymn together. All in one. Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have had for all saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. 
whereof you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day you heard it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned of Epiphas, our dear uh, fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. And we're going to stop right there. May God bless us as we're going to defend the Scripture. And uh, uh, as we go to prayer this morning, of course, uh, continue to pray for Tony. Tony's still at the rehab. And uh, John said that he caught COVID down there. So, um, which is kind of... Yeah, yeah. Which is kind of surprising because when you go down there, they test you before you go in. So somehow he got it. And, uh, but, uh, you know, so pray for him. How bad a case is it? Do you know? No, I don't say about next time because, uh, you know, he gave me a call and they said they changed his room. And he also got cold and then he sounded a little groggy, you know. Okay. And then he didn't. Continue to pray for Tony. Tony really hasn't finished his rehab, and he needs to find another place. He has some people working on looking for places. He has an opportunity to move back to Pennsylvania, where his family's from, but his choice is to stay on the island. He doesn't want to be a burden to his family. You know how that is. Continue to pray for Ronnie. Ronnie's going to a church that we're happy with, and uh, seems like she's getting used to living there and has made some friends, and I think that's pretty much it for Ronnie. Continue to pray for Miriam, and, uh, you know, uh, just continue to pray for her. Uh, as far as I know, everything's going well with her. She mentioned about coming up for a visit next year, maybe. Was it next year? This coming year. So it'll be great to have her, and we'll probably have her stay with us, or, or somebody will, that wants us. You know, we have a room. But, uh, and then she has other friends as well, so I'm not assuming anything. But pray for her. Um, pray for um, Melissa, my uh, daughter-in-law. She's ready right now, right? The baby's riding real low, but she's not due till the 10th of October. We'll pray for her. Uh, Madeline is the girl's name. Madeline what? Courtney? Okay. So, um, and they said they're finished. Believe that? I, I should. We're going to have to talk to them about that. <laughs> that doll, well, only makes us 13. We'd like to have a few more. But, it's better to have grandkids because you get to see them and visit them and then they go home at the end of the day. All right. Continue to pray for Pastor Art and Louise. How are things? How's your back, Louise? Yeah. It's, yeah, you know how it is. That's about the best answer to give, you know. The, the Lord's in control and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, pray for Jimmy and his kids. Has he been able to get his kids to come to church, Jimmy? You know? I haven't heard from him in a while. So. Um, pray for Justine. And uh, is she here? She's here? Or she's yeah, on yeah. her Okay, she's okay. She's at work right now. Yes, sir. And I'd like to pray for my mom. Okay, so pray for Justine's mom. Is that who you're talking about? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Pray for Vinny as he gets used to having his uh, new foot. Yeah, he's got an infection in the uh, wound, so. But he's doing okay, just a little bit of setback. Okay. Vinny is the, um, your nephew? Yes. Nephew that was in a motorcycle accident, lost his foot. And so they had to get a, um, some kind Prosthetic, of yeah. prosthetic foot. Not yet. But so. Pray for Dylan. Dylan's been struggling, you know, and uh, uh, he has a lot of pressure in school. Um, you know, it's not a Christian college, so there's all sorts of pressures. They're in... Uh, what do you call dorms where they have men and women? Co-ed Co dorms and, you know, sin is rampant. And, uh, you know, even some of the Christians down there are uh, not necessarily living for the Lord. So he's got being pulled right and left. And so pray for Dylan. Um, that's it. Uh, continue to pray for Dolores. How's she doing now? Thank you. Thank you for asking. 
students in uh, rehab, and uh, she took her through the worst. So last night she was taken back uh, to the hospital. Uh, she's in very great condition this morning. So I ask for prayer for her, and especially for the family. They lost uh, the worst loss of her husband last year, and that uh, Mike's dad, of course. And uh, she's not doing so well. So Pray for her. Right now, Eric is doing okay, but he's responding well to uh, this with her. Right. Uh, have your name, Thank you. Caroline Prayers. How's Caroline doing? Uh, she's coming along. She's kind of did very small process. Okay. All right. All right. Anybody have a prayer request other than what I mentioned? I think I covered it all. Let's pray together, Father. Thank you for this opportunity to come in freedom. We immediately pray for our brothers and sisters in different parts of the world where they don't have this freedom to worship. The churches have been bulldozed and knocked down. Pray for the Christian believers, Chinese believers that lost their pastor in the church that they were in, and many others that aren't mentioned in the news that. We won't hear in secular news, but in, we pray for the believers in uh, Muslim countries that are suffering greatly, especially Nigeria, where they're blatantly uh, burning and killing uh, believers. And we pray for them that they might have grace to stand. Pray for our country, Father, as uh, churches seem to be faltering and um, things are not necessarily going the way we hoped and with our government, Father. But uh, the one thing that we can count on is your faithfulness, Father. Help us just to trust you. Pray for our folks here today. And uh, pray for Matt and Mary and for keeping the lane, Pastor Art and Louise. And pray for uh, Dolores, Father, and the family, Mike especially, Father, that you would be with them. And pray for Jimmy and his kids and his hope that he would see his kids come to church somewhere. Pray for Tony, Father, that... Uh, he would get over this COVID and that someone would be able to find an apartment for him on the island. And that he would be able to walk out of the rehab and uh, pray for Justine's mom. And uh, we pray for uh, Justine, give her safety as she travels from work today. Pray for uh, uh, Benny, Father, that uh, he would uh, uh, make it through this infection, that uh, have any more complications, he'd be able to get back on his feet. And uh, pray for Matt down in Texas, Father, and continue to bless him as he uh, works down in Texas. And pray for Jared as he uh, works up here on the island that he would meet his needs and uh, give him opportunities for work. And, uh, pray for uh, Melissa, Father, that uh, the timing would be right for her birth and that everything would fall into place according to your plan, of course. And, we uh, just pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit to lead us today as we begin a study in Colossians. Colossians, Father, that uh, we would glorify you, and as we embrace your word, Father, that we might reflect on all that you have uh, accomplished in our lives. And we're thankful, Father, for all you've done for us. And pray for Eric as well as he progresses. And uh, we pray for Louise's neighbor as well. We just give him the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing uh, the. Oh, who's your what? It's open. Oh, it is? I thought it was an insert. Am I looking at the wrong bulletin? No. I feel like President Biden asking somebody to tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that. All right, just a closer walk. Let's sing this together.
Timothy might have been able to stay with him as well. Uh, so as we look at the passage, we're going to find that uh, there was the, what we would classify perhaps as the pastor, Epaphras. Now there's an Epaphrodites that we read about, and some believe they're the, the same guy, but I don't think so. It's a very common name in the first century. But he was the pastor of the church of Colossae. Uh, Paul had never been to Colossae personally, but uh, he spent two years in Ephesus and Colossae, Laodicea, and uh, there's quite a few that are quite pretty close in the Lycus Valley there. And uh, so uh, Epaphras probably was saved or educated and then started the church in Colossae. So we kind of have an idea um, of what's going on. He uh, calls Epaphras uh, our beloved fellow servant, faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. That's found in verse 7. Uh, he says that Epaphras is always striving for the Colossian Christians in his prayers. That's found in chapter 4. We're going to look at all this, but I'm just going to throw this out to you in this introduction. His letter to Philemon, uh, Paul refers to Epaphras as a, my fellow prisoner in uh, Jesus Christ. That's Philemon, Philemon 23. But I, I'm not sure if 
he ended up in prison as well, or it's just an uh, idiom that Paul uses as a fellow Christian or a fellow soldier or a fellow prisoner. Um, uh, some of the commentaries I have really kind of don't say anything about it. So um, it could be true. It could be that Epaphras made it to Rome and is discussing with Paul what's going on there because Paul deals with some heresy that's going on in there. And I'm going to share just kind of an overview of what's happening. Um, he's, Paul speaks positively of the Colossian, Colossian church, of their faith and love and hope. Uh, that's a, a result of the gospel and acknowledges that the good news is bearing fruit and growing in them. Verse 6, however, Epaphras has apparently brought Paul news of a serious problem with Colossae. Actually, I found it called the Colossian heresy in history. Uh, and Paul's writing this letter to help the Colossians to deal with those problems. Just like Ephesus and uh, um, Philippians, um, uh, as the church is growing, a uh, mixture of Jews and Gentiles, there's always an opportunity for those that come in with baggage to try to uh, introduce things into their church. So he expresses a concern that uh, in verse chapter 2 verse 4 that someone might come in to delude you with per persuasive speech. So um, why I'm going to give you all this is because I think that if you're looking for a letter epistle uh, that really is relatable to our day to day, uh, he really brings out uh, dualism and uh, Ritualism and all these other things we're going to look at in a second, just as I mentioned by in a, in the modern day church as well. So the only way to really uh, combat the chance of being deluded or being persuaded otherwise is uh, to remove yourself from the study of God's word. If you're not readily in the word of God, you can open yourself up to buying into someone's idea of something that they might have got from some scripture but sounds really uh, good to them you know and we'll talk about that in a moment he cautions them to be careful that you don't let anyone rob you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men um, he reminds them that they were dead through their trespasses and the uncircumcision of their flesh but Christ made you alive together with them. So we have uh, Paul's emphasis on Christ. And some would say that uh, Colossian letter is one of the most potent Christological books of the Bible. And we're going to look at that in the next week or two when he talks about um, who Jesus is in a theological framework and, uh, you know, his connection with the Father and uh, it's really kind of really eye-revealing because he's dealing with uh, heresies that are coming in that reduce, the, uh, reduce or diminish the deity of Christ and um, make him a creation instead of the creator. So, and that's a lot of things that we find today in a lot of churches. Uh, even churches that would classify themselves as Christianity or Christian churches uh, they would have a problem with the deity of Christ and they have a problem with the supernatural aspects of the Bible and uh, so it's helpful for us to know the Word of God and so even though you might not have a Bible degree uh, you have the Holy Spirit that lives inside you that can guide you and of course church is always here and this is where we uh, together look into the Word of God um, we're depending on the Holy Spirit to guide us and uh, help us to grow closer to Him. And this is Paul's desire for the church in Colossae as well, that they might grow in uh, knowing His will. We're going to look at that in a few moments. He tells them not to let anyone judge them, eating and drinking, or with the respective feast days, or the new moon, or the Sabbath, or ordinances. Do not subject yourself to ordinances. Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. So that's in chapter 2. We're going to look at that as well. But um, I'm giving you kind of a taste of what uh, Colossians is about. He includes advice to wives and husbands and children and servants and 
masters concerning their relationship with each other in chapter 3 and 4. So really kind of a well-rounded epistle uh, that uh, is designed to uh, immunize the church from these blatant heresies that are coming their way. While Paul deals with their problems one by one, he first seeks to ground the Colossian Christians solidly in the basics of the faith, and Christ is at the center of this faith. And that's uh, chapter 1, 15 through 20. That's going to be a separate message uh, one Sunday as well. So if these Colossian Christians can better understand the nature and mission of Christ, who Christ was, is, and what Christ has come to do for them, that understanding will give them a firm footing to deal with the problems with that Epiphras has identified. Um, we might characterize Paul's strategy as filling the believers there, Colossi, with good beliefs so that the bad beliefs won't make uh, headway into their lives. Or we might look at it as uh, the North Star as a metaphor. People who navigate by the stars find the North Star especially helpful. Uh, they get a fix on things. And this would be the Christological foundation that Paul's going to give them so that they have a firm foundation to be able to recognize heresy when it comes their way. Um, there are some uh, non-denominational churches. Now, some people really like that idea. Let's get rid of the Baptist um, denomination word and uh, just be non-denominational. I'd just like to just share with you from my experience. Now, there can be a lot of good churches that are non-denominational, uh, Baptistic to the core, but a lot of times when a non-denominational church uh, can take on different aspects of different churches, depending on who the pastor is or the leadership of that time. So um, when a church says Baptist, you kind of get an idea, unless it's an American Baptist or something, independent Baptist, that they're pretty solid on the foundations of the scriptures. And that's just a little tidbit for denominations, because I find that in my reading that there are a lot of people that are turning away from saying that they're a Baptist because of the stigma of uh, some of the other uh, Baptist churches from the past, Southern Baptists. And there's a Baptist church out west that are, they're nuts. They're not even believers, but they call themselves Baptist churches. So for fear of that, they're trying to, they remove this one equation that I think is necessary in a church sometimes uh, so that you can kind of have a, a witness just by the name of the church. Uh, so let's, uh, all right, that didn't take as long as I thought, so that's good. Let's go to chapter one and uh, let's look at what Paul has to say. It's a general introduction. Paul, and then he says, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So let's look at grace and peace and uh, let's look at what Paul says here and try to make sense of it. So Paul, an apostle, that's apostolus. That's uh, someone that's sent by from God with a message. And uh, loosely translated today, there are people that claim to be apostles even today. And uh, I'm not sure what their definition is of it because they'll say, well, they're messengers of God with the gospel, but they claim this office that was only in the first century. And the qualifications of the apostle ones that had to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul wasn't a part of the Twelve, but we know that he met Christ on the road to Damascus and was commissioned by God and was selected by God to go to the Gentiles. So that's not a question. Some of the more liberal writers in what we would classify as Christendom would take a, uh, they would question whether Paul was really the author of this book because of some of the words that he uses. But um, most and 90% of what I have um, have no problem with Paul as the authorship. Now he uses uh, Jesus Christ through the will. That's the word thalmatos. That's uh, from thalmatima of God. So he, he talks about the will. He, he does that on more than one occasion to ensure that the readers understand that Paul didn't select to be an apostle, but by God's will he was who he was. It's important for us to know that God's will is more important than our will. And Paul stresses that 
in the idea that he prays for the Colossi church that they might know God's will and uh, be able to uh, build off of that. He mentions uh, Timothy, our brother, Timotheus. And Timothy um, was, uh, if you read the book of Timothy, uh, introduction to that, you'll find out about him. But he was uh, a spiritual son of Paul and a co-worker. And uh, uh, Timothy was very helpful with Paul and probably pro helped provide for Paul as he was there. Um, both MacArthur and Begg and even uh, a guy from Dallas surmised that Timothy probably even stayed with Paul, that Paul rented some kind of apartment and uh, uh, Timothy was there. So it says, uh, to the saints and faithful, we kind of go look at that and understand, well, it's talking about the believers, but I look at that, the saints is a positional phrase. Uh, hagios is the word for holy, set apart. And uh, if you know Christ is your Savior, you're sinless in God's sight. So uh, there, that's the same part. The faithful actually is the uh, end result of this transformation that God did to us uh, when we came to Christ as new creatures. And so the uh, evidence of that is found in faithfulness. And they were known for being faithful. And another characteristic of this church was they were known for the love they had for the brethren. That's an interesting thing because hate is an easy thing to acquire. You know, I don't like the way that guy looks or uh, something along those lines like that. But for the believer, there should be this love for the brethren. And uh, uh, that cannot be manufactured by ourselves. Uh, something that comes as we grow in our relationship to Christ. But he says to the saints and faithful, brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. So there's a there's a, um, a marker there to understand that this letter was written to Colossae. Some that I've read said that Ephesians really was a circular letter. And uh, um, it's not found on some of the early manuscripts. I'm not sure about that. But um, Ephesus and all of these letters found their way to all the churches eventually. Now, one more thing about uh, Colossae. In 62 or 63, uh, there was a great earthquake that pretty much devastated the town. And uh, there was a road that goes between Colossae and um, some other big town. Uh, but Laodicea and uh, per Laodicea was uh, another village that was growing. So by that time, Colossae really was diminishing, and Laodicea was growing. Uh, about 60 miles away, I think, someone wrote the city. I just say that just to give you the information about it. So. Um, we find that the church is being inundated with these heresies, and Paul begins the process of addressing to the believers there, to the saints and faithful. And uh, even in verse 3, he gives thanks to God the Father for our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. So that's Paul's normal occasion. Paul, of course, was not, uh, you know, uh, one to... Um, To overlook anything as he writes these epistles, and Epaphras really kind of filled them in on what was happening in the church. Uh, so, uh, when we look at what Paul says here, what I did was I broke it all down in this pieces here, and we, I gave you the word "thelema," as by the will of God. Uh, the call of Saul to become an apostle had its beginning in the will of God, obviously on the road to Damascus, and. Uh, God has a thalema, a will, a plan for each one of us. Uh, this is something that you really need to consider in your life, that God has a plan for you. And not based on who you are, uh, like a wife or a husband or a child, but as a believer, if you remember from when we went through Ephesians, uh, we are his workmanship, and he's... Uh, developing us to fulfill the will that he has for us that was established before the foundations of the world. So God has a plan for each one of us. And so uh, Paul brings this out to remind the Colossi church that uh, there's a will there. There's a plan for their lives. He has a particular space for each one of them and us as well. 
uh, that we occupy in this spiritual universe. It is his will that we occupy that particular space. And we can fulfill God's will or purpose for us only as we seek to fill that space. Um, that's why it doesn't pay to look at others or compare each other, compare us to them, because God has a specific plan for each one of us as believers today. So that's the lema that Paul brings out is an important word uh, that he uses to help them understand that they're not just there as a church, even though perhaps the town is faltering, but God has a plan for them as well. So we need to be careful when we think about God's will for our lives, because there are false teachers that abound today, uh, teaching people that God wants them to be rich, to drive a Mercedes, to wear a Rolex, and people respond favorably to that kind of theology, uh, that kind of teaching, because the false teachers are telling them what they want to hear. Uh, you wonder why uh, Joel Olstein's church is so large. What do you think is a percentage of believers in that church? I'm sure it's pretty low, uh, but not to pick on anybody out of the ordinary. Uh, Christ doesn't call us to become rich and to accumulate expensive toys. <coughs> Be nice, but that's not our intent, because if we understand why we're here and where we're going, the, the sojourner part of our existence, it makes a lot of sense for us. Christ calls us to take up our cross and follow him. That's Matthew chapter 10. So he calls us to a servant ministry. To give food to those who are hungry and water to those who are thirsty. To welcome strangers. To visit those who are sick or in prison. That's Matthew chapter 25. So I'm going to paint a little picture of what God actually wants us to do on this earth. He teaches us that it is more blessed to give than to receive, Acts chapter 20. He teaches us that a rich man will enter the kingdom of heaven with great difficulty. Uh, and that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, Matthew chapter 19. So uh, basing your understanding of God's blessing on what you have accumulated is probably an unbiblical way of looking at how God has blessed you. Um, However, the gospel, the good news, is that with men of this, the salvation of a, this rich man, it's impossible if he's placing his faith in his riches. Uh, it, but with God, all things are possible. So even a rich man, if God draws him and calls him, can embrace the gospel message. So it's not hopeless, but what the Bible kind of reveals is that it's up to, all up to God and how he deals with the believers and unbelievers as well. Consider how God called worked itself out in Paul's life that uh, Paul became rich and famous as a Pharisee. He had everything he ever wanted. And uh, admittedly, he did become famous much more than most Christians, but he did become, um, he didn't become rich and comfortable. Uh, he mentions that, that he learned to be content whether he was abased or had abundance. So we understand that from uh, last week, um, he had a vacation home on a. He didn't have a vacation home, and, and you know, um, Adrian Rogers. I, I copied this out of one of his books that I have. He he says that uh, um, was Paul rich? Was he financially secure? Uh, yes and no. Paul was okay with whatever he had. So the security part had nothing to do with his riches. He was thankful when the church helped him. But uh, that wasn't necessarily necessary for him to be content. Excuse me. <coughs> yeah, actually, if you were interested, and I think you are, if you went to Second Corinthians, I'm not going to have you turn there because of time. But I just threw the gist down. He said this: five times from the Jews, I received forty stripes minus one. Why he says minus one is forty is the death penalty. So one less, he survived. I guess that's what they mean. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was suffered shipwreck. I have been a night and a day in the deep. I have been in travels often, perils of rivers, perils of robbers, perils from my countrymen, perils from the Gentiles, 
perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, in the sea, among false brothers, in labor and travail, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, and in cold and nakedness. That's, that, that's in chapter 11, 2 Corinthians. Read it for yourself. So his uh, resume was filled with things that you wouldn't expect to be there. Uh, but he, what I liked about Paul was, and I, I've run into people that said, I don't, they don't like Paul because Paul's all about rules. They kind of missed the idea that Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't Paul's idea not to do this or that. God was directing him, and he wrote most of the New Testament. But Paul kind of gives them an idea that um, and to the Colossi Church and to the Philippians and to Philippians and Ephesians, uh, that um, if you're looking for the good life, you're not necessarily going to see that uh, in what would the world would call the evidence of a good life. So for us, in application, um, our expectation is not the material things, but the spiritual things. And I can make the case that most rich people are looking to try to get what we get in salvation. Rich people want to have peace. They want to be content. They want to feel secure. But all their money and property don't give them that. Why do you say that? Well, just think about all of those people that have all of that, that kill themselves with drugs and get all sorts of diseases by hopping into bed with anybody they want. Um, they live behind tall walls because they're afraid of everybody and they're afraid that they're going to lose whatever they have. Yet believers can have that peace, a reine, that came from shalom in Hebrew which means peace from God and have contentment from God so that you can be happy and delightly driving down the road in an old rusty Yugo and be content with a, a simple meal and a simple house and simple clothes and uh, have everything that they're trying to get. Now, I'm not maybe not being as convinced as I could because you might want that Yugo, I mean, or the Mercedes or something like that. And uh, most of us have had really nice things and realized they don't really give you that much pleasure. And uh, you might not like a nice car, but I like a nice, you know, payment, you know. You know so as we get older, we, we find kind of fine-tune our, our desires and wants. And, um, you know, uh, there's an old uh, proverb that said that, uh, an old rabbi that said, um, you know, he had a terrible life, and I'm trying to go by memory, and they were feeling sorry for me. He says, listen, I have bread, I have water, and I have Christ. What more is there? You know, he was kind of breaking down the idea that with the Lord Jesus Christ, we have everything, even if we have nothing. And that's kind of a state that uh, I think that we all can achieve as we remember who he was and what he accomplished and where we're going as believers. So... Uh, don't respond to Christ's call thinking that your faithfulness will bring you riches. Seek to do the will of God, understanding that God will ask you to do hard things. Your blessing will be a life well lived, a life full of purpose, a life in which you will store up treasures in heaven, and, uh, but probably not on earth. Matthew chapter 6 talks about that. Then he says uh, in verse uh, 1 at the end, Timothy our brother, and uh, I think I talked about that, but Paul met Timothy uh, when he was young in Lystra, in Timothy's hometown, that's Acts chapter 16. And Timothy joined Paul on some of his uh, missionary journeys and became one of Paul's trusted co-workers. And uh, we're going to discuss that as we go through the passage here. In his final greeting, uh, Paul uh, mentions uh, other Christian friends at the end of the book that will hit Tychicus and Aristarchus and Mark and Jesus who... Um, who was called Justice, Epiphas, Luke, Demas. That's in chapter 4. So Paul's decision to include Timothy in the front is kind of significant. That's why some people think that maybe Timothy was the, uh, um, maybe the secretary. But I'm not sure if I'd go that far. But Paul wrote two letters, first and second Timothy, to Timothy to encourage him, uh, give him guidance, um, and uh, help him um, as an older 
experienced missionary to this young very experienced man. So it's a really neat picture that we get from Colossae and from some of the other books about the relationship with Timothy. And uh, he calls Timothy Adelphios, which is our brother. And uh, Timothy wasn't an apostle, but his designation as a brother is worth noting. Jesus said that his followers should consider themselves to be members of a family. Now, we don't say that here. In the southern churches, a lot of times they'll say sister, Margaret, and brother, so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, I think it's lost its potency, but uh, I think of our church as a small family. You know, we all love Christ, and we're all here for a reason. Uh, God has drawn us here. And uh, so um, you might think, well, I wish we had 100 people here. And that might, might be nice, but uh, the smaller the group, the more uh, intimate we can be as far as knowing each other and praying for each other. And uh, uh, as you get older, you see the value in prayer more and more. Uh, and as we pray for each other and uh, direction and guidance and all these other things. How many have doctor's appointments this week? Yeah, you know, I'm surprised that not everybody puts up their hand, you know. And uh, Margaret's actually wearing a, halt, a harness not, not a horse harness, a heart harness. You know, that's the joke of the day, and I'll get slapped that later. No, that's all okay. But uh, I always thought that I'd be the one with the stints and the harness, and here Margaret beats me too with the punch. But when we think of Colossae, and uh, next week we're going to look at Paul's uh, prayer, uh, he says to the saints, Hagioi is the Hagios is the word. Uh, and faithful brothers. So in, in a combination, um, in Christ and Colossae, Paul pays these Colossians uh, two compliments, calling them both saints and uh, um, the faithful. Uh, you know, uh, Paul often speaks of Haggai, a word that means holy ones, but it's usually translated saints. In our English uh, language Bibles, Paul writes to all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints. Romans 1 7. And so the usage there is interesting. Uh, but, you know, saints, uh, holy ones, kind of just kind of designates God's people. Um, just to finish, I wanted to throw this out because I was doing some research and jotted some things down. The idea of this phrase, holy ones or holy ones, has its roots in the Old Testament, understanding holiness. Uh, there we can learn that God is holy. People and things become holy by association with God. The ground on which Moses stood was holy because God was present there. Exodus 3. Mount Sinai was holy because God gave Moses the law there. Exodus 19. The Sabbath day is holy because it commemorates the day that God uh, rested in Exodus uh, 20. The tabernacle and its furnishings were holy because the tabernacle was the dwelling place of God in Exodus 26. Burnt offerings or sacrifices were holy because they were sacrificed to God. Uh, the list goes on. But mostly, especially the people of God are holy because they, are, they belong to God. Deuteronomy chapter 28. So saints are people who have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ. Um, Hebrews chapter 10. So there's a connection between the two usages that Paul kind of breaks out. It, it satisfied the Jewish readers and I kind of included the Gentiles in this understanding of holy or set apart for God. We don't use the word sanctified much anymore, uh, but it's related to the word hagios. And, um, sanctified means made holy. So uh, you'll hear that a lot of times in scriptures. And, but in our normal language, we don't necessarily use that. Hebrews, the author Hebrews, which some people believe Paul was, uh, says that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ, Jesus Christ, it means that Jesus Christ was made, had made us holy. Uh, that doesn't mean that Jesus has made us perfect, obviously, um, complete, but it does not mean that Christ has made us holy. Uh, it does mean that he made us holy and set us apart for a godly purpose called uh, to live holy lives. That's where that thelema comes back in. God has a will for us. It's word, yeah. We're going to look at charis, and that's the word for grace uh, that Paul uses. 
Um, it's a significant word in New Testament, obviously, especially in Paul's epistles. Um, has its root word in Hebrew, and has that, which is the Old Testament to speak of God's loving kindness, mercy, and faithfulness. In, in uh, classical Greek, it's often used to, to talk about patronage, uh, the support of a patron, uh, such as financial and political support. So Paul uses this known fiscal word in, in this Christian uh, phraseology now to help them understand and make the transition into the idea that as believers now, we are, because of what Christ has accomplished, we are faithful to him. Um, the Greeks, uh, the word charos connote a generosity and demanded loyalty on the part of the recipient. So it's easy to uh, understand why Paul used or adapted charis to the gospel message. And one last thing that I would throw out, and it says that peace, uh, arrange, peace, significant word in the Old Testament and New Testament, obviously, arrange in the New Testament, but has its roots in the Hebrew word shalom, which we all know, which was used frequently in the Old Testament. The Septuagint, uh, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses the Greek word arrange to translate the Hebrew word shalom nearly 200 times in the New Testament. Both of these words can refer to that inner kind of peace, the kind of well-being that is derived from this relationship. It also can be used on an exterior as well, as God gives us peace and uh, organizes our life. Um, yeah, I think that's good enough for a word study. So as we begin this study in Colossians, we're going to look at these various difficulties, and I'm going to name them in the passage as we get past them. Paul's prayer. And uh, if you take the time and put the pieces together, it will help you uh, really with your understanding of who Christ is. And uh, that will help you uh, build that foundation so that when you hear these <coughs> false theologies that are floating around, you hear them on the radio all the time. Very subtle, but really kind of diluting uh, the deity of Christ and uh, removing him from his place and uh, moving him down. If you talk to a Muslim, they say, yeah, we believe in Jesus. Yeah, he's the son of God. But their words don't match their definitions. And uh, I had a fellow in my last church that wanted me to uh, publicly say that, you know, they're just the same as us. They believe in God. They just call God a different name. And how wrong he was. And I refused to do that, which caused a little bit of trouble. But, if you have the opportunity, read the book of uh, Colossae. It's very short, four chapters. And let's prepare for this study. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity. Uh, even though I gave a lot of information, Father, we're going to look at it again. But help us to grow closer to you as we embrace your word. Pray for our church folks, Father, as we fellowship downstairs. Uh, bless the food to our bodies. Help us to be an encouragement to one another. And uh, we're thankful for your word, thankful for the Holy Spirit that rides, resides inside us. Uh, thankful for the opportunity to have peace and to sense your presence, Father. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing one more hymn, right? I've got ahead of myself. But uh, I, I don't. Is it, uh, did uh, Jay show up? So he's out there grilling. Okay, so he's happy. Let's say only one life to live. Let's stand together.
Thank you. 